on WebRTC, this great uh, API uh, that allows us to do browser-to-browser -browser communications without any plugins or downloads. So last year, uh, I gave a speech about this emerging technology, and a lot of things happened this year. For instance, Google Hangouts migrated to uh, WebRTC. Uh, Snapchat acquired uh, an API called AdLive to have the video inside Snapchat. All of these were WebRTC companies, and there will be other ones uh, coming soon. So a lot of things happen. So as WebRTC is very successful, uh, the organizers invited me this year uh, to talk at API Days uh, in Berlin, at API Strategy in Amsterdam. So I really thank uh, Mehdi and the organizers uh, for inviting me today. But when I was talking about this speech, I said, should I really uh, thank him? Because one month ago, I was having lunch with uh, Mehdi, and we were talking about today. Um, and he invited me to give this speech. So I know the rule of the event, uh, no self-promotion or technology showcase uh, of my company. So he said, Louis, this time I don't want to hear about web real-time communications. What I really would like to know is give us a speech on what will telecom look like in 2020. So I said, sure, I, I can do it. I mean, uh, I have a cloud communications API. I travel like most of the people in this room in lots of brilliant conferences. I know a lot of speakers. I have a lot of slides, takeaways, presentations, everything. But then I felt very bad and I said, how can I predict uh, the future? I mean, I'm not a prophet, and I don't want to give you a presentation, a very boring presentation, about telecom technologies. Uh, I see Manfred here in the, in the room, who worked for the GSMA. He knows about what I talk about. So when I go to telecom conferences, not API or web conferences, the keywords are RCS, voice over LTE, uh, a lot of acronyms that in fact, nobody in this industry really uh, cares about. So it was, I started feeling like really very bad. How am I going to introduce uh, this subject? Because being a prophet is a real uh, job. So talking about jobs, I turned to my friend uh, Steve, and he said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect you in your future. So to do this presentation, I thought it was interesting to go a little in the back of the history of telecom, then focus a little bit on the present, and then I have a little surprise, because usually all the events where I go finish with a panel, what is the future of telecom? And I always love these panels because anyone can tell anything. So I asked some industry experts to give me a quote on how uh, they see the future of telecoms. But the first thing, in my title of the presentation, there is the word innovation. So let's travel a little bit in the past. Here, we have a very old guy called Antonio Meucci. There is a polemic about him because, in fact, some people say he invented the telephone and some other, and that's the official version, say it's Alexander Graham Bell. I prefer to say uh, that it's both. So Antonio Meucci, he was born uh, originally uh, in Italy, and he was admitted at 15 years at the Florence Academy of Arts, where he studied chemical and mechanical engineering. But his destiny was already there. He had to stop studying two years after uh, and get a job. So he got a job uh, as a, a gatekeeper. Once he got his job, he started working on technology. And he changed his job, and he got a job at the Teatro Pergola in Florence, where he was a stage technician. In this theater, he fell in love with a lady, and he started working on mechanisms to uh, communicate between the control room and the stage, and also to listen all kinds of things. This was his first approach. But because B Meucci was very implicated in politics, and it was Garibaldi time and Italy independence, he had 
to move away from Italy, and he went to Cuba, and he took his wife. When he arrived uh, in Cuba, he took the same job in a theater, and he made a lot of money doing small uh, inventions. And then he decided, because of Morse, the guy who invented Morse, that it was time uh, to go away to the US, uh, to the gold rush, and live of his inventions. So first, first he built a candle uh, factory, he took the money out of it, and he spent like 25 years uh, doing research and development uh, on the future of the telephone. And he came out with an invention which was the uh, talking telegraph. In the meantime, his wife uh, became ill. So here the opportunity was, I, have to, I am in my lab and I have to communicate with my wife. So he built uh, the first prototype of the phone to communicate with his wife on the second floor. The following of the story is, is not a very funny story, unfortunately, for Antonio Miucci, because uh, he had to, to give the money to, for the health of his wife, so he had less and less money, so he couldn't even file the patents for all his works. His wife sold uh, some of his drawings, uh, so he had never the proof that what inve his invention was the future uh, telephone. But still, in 1870, he did the teletrofono, and here uh, is the picture and the mechanism of the teletrofono. And at the end of the day, this guy died. Uh, he never got the recognition, and he even uh, sued uh, Alexander Graham Bell, but unfor unfortunately, he was so unlucky that nobody ever found his drawings and he had no proofs. And it's only like after year 2000 that he was recognized as being the inventor of telephone. I have uh, no choice on that. For me, it's the same. It's Miucci and, and, and Bell. Uh, both of them did a great job. So let's move to 1881 in France. This gentleman is Clément Adair. Uh, in France, he's famous for other things than telephone. But in fact, uh, he's the one who connected the first telephone network uh, in Paris. And in 1881, there was a universal exhibition of electricity in France, and he built something very original, which was called a theater phone. Here you see uh, the map of uh, the exposition building and the connection to the opera. So the principle was very simple. It was you pick like the headset and you can listen to live music. But Clément Adair had other passions in life. Uh, so he left this idea and two entrepreneurs, let's say, took over this, company, this idea and built the Seattle Phone Company, which was half an hour walk uh, from here, Rue Louis Le Grand. And in fact, they did a very uh, nice infrastructure. So here you see the infrastructure, centralized infrastructure, uh, Rue Louis Le Grand, and then you had all the connections to all the theaters. There was a distribution board and an operator also. And you can see that there was a whole ecosystem emerging out of it with ads for the theater phone. Uh, you can go to the Musée Grévin and you had like some stations where you can hear to music or you could stay at home and you had the programs. And in fact, it became uh, a very popular uh, app, let's say, uh, because during, until 1930, and when radio came, everybody was using that. And it, it went to north of Europe, to Portugal, the country I come from. Uh, it, it traveled all over the world. But Clément Adair sold all his telephony business and he went in the flying objects, so in the drone uh, industry, and he built the EOL, uh, which was one of the first uh, flying, uh, let's say, devices. But still, we owe him this great invention. The third gentleman I would like to talk about is Almond uh, Stroger. And I learned during my presentation that the word undertaker, which is literally in French entrepreneur, means in fact the guy who is uh, taking care of burying uh, the people. So Almond Stroger um, was the owner of an undertaking business in Kansas City. And he was a little bit like paranoid uh, at, the, at this time 
because telephony at this time was you call the operator and the operator switches the call uh, to the person you want to call. And he was convinced that his main competitor uh, was taking all the calls for him because his wife was working at the operator company. So he decided to work on a mechanism that would allow to take control of the call by uh, the user. And here we have the picture of Emanet with the, the first operator, and you see how the working conditions were very difficult at that time. And he built the Strauger automatic company. So we owe to this guy, we owe to Steve Jobs to, to click uh, on, a, on, on a screen, but we owe to this guy to have a dial pad. And we owe more than that, we owe to this guy uh, the switching principle of telephony. So he basically replicated uh, the human gestures by a machine and with electrical impulse to simulate the same operations, and it worked. And today, PBXs, uh, private brands exchange switches, work on the same principle. Uh, now they work on software, but there are a lot, still a lot of PBXs working on this principle. So thank you, Mr. Strauger. We come near, so we jump here almost 100 years. There are so many people, I mean, in the telecom uh, world that I couldn't do all of them, so I picked some of them. So John Draper, uh, who is also known as uh, Captain Crunch. So you can see from his face uh, that he's a, a hacker. So he is a telephone hacker, and he was, they were called the Freakers. Why is he called Captain Crunch? Because, <clears throat> in fact, inside the Captain Crunch cereals, there was a blue whistle, and when you took this whistle, that's the legend, you could simulate the same frequency, 2,600 Hz, that the operators would use to switch long-distance calls. So that was the way they hacked, uh, he hacked the lines. What is funny in this story, we can see here that history always repeats. Uh, there were kind of meetups at the time, and there was this homebrew computer uh, club. And Draper came to this meetup and presented the principles of his blue box. And there were two guys in the audience, and they were Steve Jobs and, and Wozniak. And they needed money because they were young, they had a lot of ideas. So Wozniak was also a sort of pirate. He liked to do some, something, some borderline legally things. And Jobs was, of course, already a marketing genius and a great sales guy. So they took over the idea and they built blue boxes. And they resold these blue boxes. And eventually, to build the Apple I, they resold $6,000 of blue boxes. Uh, Jobs, I think, sold uh, his Volkswagen van. And Wozniak sold his HP computer to finance the first prototypes of the Apple I. The biographer of Steve Jobs uh, here is a quote, says that without the blue boxes, there would never have been uh, Apple uh, computers. So I think that telecom is really a very disruptive uh, industry. And I took this picture out of many pictures I saw of the blue boxes because, and there is a video, I'll, I'll, I'll put the presentation then online, that you can see where Steve Jobs himself explains back in the 80s what the blue box uh, showed to him. And I think this code is interesting because it said we gained the confidence that we could solve technical problems and put something in pr production. And this picture is funny because when you look at the video, it looks like an iPhone box. And I, I couldn't <laughs> refrain from thinking that, that, that the design was also a little bit inspired by this, his first uh, experience. So I went away from Draper uh, to uh, Steve Jobs. So what did Draper uh, become? Draper went to jail during five years and here you can see an ad from Bell of Pennsylvania uh, about stealing a phone call is in the game because it was really uh, very bad. So he got arrested, but Jobs and Wozniak were always friends with him and he even became an engineer uh, in the early years uh, of Apple. So let, let's stop a little bit and, and say, okay, what did we learn about innovation from Miyuchi? Uh, I would say, okay, the technical genius, but never give up. The guy never gave up. He spent 50 years doing research. He died, and he only got the recognition 100 years after.
from other, who the, the, passion, the passion of other was not telephony, it was cars and, and, and aviation. So he got the cash out uh, of the telephony to finance his dream. So work for your life dreams. And Strauger, he had a problem and he solved him by, by himself. And in fact, when he built the first switchboard, it was doing, done out of straight pins and uh, round board uh, color, so with very basic uh, elements. And lastly, the, the blue box. Uh, there's a good lesson in this one, is to say, okay, with very, very low cost uh, material and some ideas and some talent, you can take advantage of third party uh, infrastructures. And I would add, of course, legally if possible, but we all know that in technology, it sometimes starts uh, illegally. So le let's reconnect uh, a little bit the dots. Uh, I mean, we, we have learnings uh, from this. The Meucci phone or the Graham Bell invention uh, is the same thing, let's say, as the smartphone or the iPhone. The theater phone was the first uh, on-demand music uh, service available to people. People could buy it by subscription, could listen like two minutes or half an hour or stay at home. I mean, there was a segmentation in the consumers uh, of music at that time. Strauger, I think, and this is the one who I think is more interesting for us here today, was the first uh, guy to automate uh, a process. And that's what communication APIs uh, do today. That's what my company does. We do voice automation, we do messaging automation, we do only automation, and we give the control back uh, to the user or to the developer. And the blue box, in fact, nowadays we all have blue boxes. We use Viber or we use Skype. These are making long distance calls for free. So the dream turned uh, to reality. So how, how from all these inventions, uh, which in fact, let's say, repeat in history, how are we going uh, in the present uh, to innovate. So let's start by, by the present. We all hear that telecom has become a commodity. Uh, so we really need in telecoms to differentiate uh, the services. It's not, maybe not anymore only in the, on the technology side, but on the services side. And I like, there is an expression I love. This is the present, which is the uberification of everything. Nowadays, uh, the value chain of services is being disrupted. The eight-step process here, now you can do it in three clicks. That's, for me, really disruption. It relies on technology, it relies on the networks, but it really relies also of an, on an approach, different approach of consuming services. And all these uh, apps need uh, communication APIs inside. So. Communication APIs go inside the apps. Here there is a, a small wall because it's become an industry and it's a heavy trend uh, today how services are brought to people. And this trend is going uh, to increase in the future. We are going to consume services through apps. So now you're going to tell me what about the 2020 telco innovation? We saw all these brilliant guys and so on. So I told you at the beginning of the presentation, I'm not a prophet, but I know some guys who are supposed to be. So what I did is that I took my phone, my mail, and I wrote to some of them and got some replies. So I wanted to share these replies. Manfred here also knows a lot of these guys. These guys are the ones who I meet more uh, in the telecom industry events. And they have their own opinions, so as they are not here for the final panel, I will give them the word. So the first question, do you in the room believe that telcos will be able to innovate? Do you think that telcos will be the guys who will be innovating and bringing you the services in the next uh, years? Okay, let's ask the experts. So first one, one, you know, uh, Alan, it's, it's, it's very, Alan advocates a lot for changing mentality in the telecom industry. He advocates a lot for APIs in very 
big companies, which are telcos, with very fixed mentalities, with silos, and with a lot, let's say, of people who only think of the bonus of the end of the year and not about innovating. And back to the examples I gave before, it's not the right way uh, to in innovate. He also advocates again, like he says, against Donbass regulation. You have the GSMA, you have telecom is a very regulated um, sector. So these are all breaks to innovation. Thank you, Alan. Chris is, is, a, is a brilliant guy. He now works, he used to work for Genband, and now he works in a smaller company, consultancy com company, and he's a very big advocate of web real-time communications, and he's a great business developer, he's a great presenter, and he's a very funny uh, guy. He, said, he speaks about uh, decreasing uh, market uh, relevancy, and I think this is a very important uh, point. And he points also the fact that doing nothing remains a very viable strategy. If I ask in the room what are the big innovations in the last five years that come from telcos, I don't know who would be able really to answer to me. Then I gave the word in my panel uh, to Dan, who is a W3C author, also working a lot on standardization of WebRTC, so like really the big brain. Um, and he told me, you have to watch both net neutrality and communication taxes and said there are going to be a lot uh, of regulation and taxes and there is really concern uh, about that in the next decade. So, control. Another one, who is an independent market analyst uh, who has a site very interesting called Disruptive Analysis uh, and he's quite disruptive. I think what I like here in this quote, I didn't put it in, 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 in black ink, is, yeah, there will be other participants entering in the market and become important. And I love, like, the balloons uh, and drones, but why not? I mean, think of all the guys 100 years ago. And, yes, telecoms is far too important to just leave it to the telcos. Then I moved to Chad uh, from Dialogic. They are pure telecom people. And I like this. The telecom services will all look and act like the web and mobile app ecosystem today. The web and the mobile must change uh, the landscape. And I leave the last word to Tsai, uh, who is at Amdocs and has a great blog about WebRTC. And he thinks that nothing uh, will change, but the telcos will still be complaining about other service providers uh, like the WhatsApp and so on eating their lunch. So we need APIs for telecom disruption. I, we won't go in, in, into the detail of all these topics, but uh, the networks will be software defined so that they can scale. We need automated telecom cloud through APIs. And Internet of Things also requires API automation. We will have like maybe 50 billion devices uh, that will be programmed by 5 million developers. This will not be done without a great uh, network and without um, genius. <laughs> so I, I know that in this conference we always hear that uh, software is eating the world, APIs are eating software, and software is also eating the network. And this is a very important point uh, for the 2020 uh, perspective. So as APIs are eating software, they will also Eat the network. Thank you. Wow, thank you for this lecture, right? <laughs> so, do you have any question so far uh, about the telco history? Not even Google Glass questions? Too clear. <laughs> yeah, question here. Hi, thanks for your <coughs> sharing those uh, visions with us. And my question would be, okay, making prediction like most of the people agree with is not so much complicated. The much more difficult thing is to predict when. Mm -hmm. You see the failure going uh, around the fortress, but you don't know when the fortress will fall down. So what's your vision about the timing? I, my vision about the timing, I, 
I don't think like there will be, um, I mean, five years ago, uh, if Mehdi would ask me to give this presentation, I don't think I would have been able to predict like WhatsApp, for instance, or Snapchat. Snapchat is the five, in the, in the top five or 10 of, of the most expensive like internet companies. Who, who can predict that? What I wanted to say through this presentation is that uh, is give a message to anyone is that, okay, the infrastructure is there. One thing is sure, in my last I said, the telecom cloud, as it is today, uh, will not allow to scale. So there are a lot of opportunities because it's, it's done for broadband data and voice services. So there are a lot of opportunities like in the data centers, in the software defined network. And I mean, that's the infrastructure which will, will prepare uh, to what will happen as revolutionary in the, in the next uh, five years, okay? I don't think that there will be like a new WhatsApp or a new Snapchat or, I mean, this is regionalized. You have a, a local WhatsApp, a worldwide WhatsApp, then you have like Line, you have Kakao Talk, and you have like European ones. My vision is that um, it's the web, the API people, uh, the mobile thinking people who will innovate uh, in the next five years. That, that's my vision. For sure, not the guy sitting in a room in a telecom company. I'm sorry if there are some telcos in the room. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Yeah, please. Uh, hi, Luis. Um, I'm Aurelien from Orange. Hi, glad, Aurelien. Um, glad to see that uh, you. You want to work with operators. It's, uh, <laughs> very, uh, very nice to hear that you are thinking this of us. Um, uh, honestly, uh, I'm not going to argue, but uh, it's true that we are not exactly uh, at the top of innovation every day. However, I'm wondering if um, uh, the vision where you say innovation is going to happen, happen uh, outside of telcos is really true. Because working on APIs at Orange, uh, actually I see more uh, cooperation opportunities rather than competing, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with uh, guys like uh, Facebook or Google, uh, we keep on finding partners, uh, part, um, partnerships around APIs. So I'm not so sure it's right the I one or the other. Um, okay, thank you. I I agree with you, and it's not because you're from Orange and that you're in the room. Orange, let's say, is not the less innovating, but you're not the only telco in the world. Orange has done very nice things, like Libon, for instance, which is like the, uh, the Orange OTT service uh, that I personally use when I travel, so I'm a, an Orange customer. Um, and yes, I think uh, you, you gave the answer. The solution for the telcos is not to, to close on themselves, but to partner, uh, like probably you do, uh, with external companies, smaller companies, with uh, APIs of all kind of APIs. And the innovation will come uh, from this. My, my point was not to say telcos don't innovate. It's rather the way they do it, uh, or how do they plan to do it in the next years if they really want to bring something new. But I mean, Orange is like, or AT&T are huge uh, operators. Uh, but there are a lot of smaller ones uh, also. And these ones will probably remain like dumb pipes or uh, things that will not uh, interest or that they are selling like mobile and data services. But in five years, what, what will they do if they don't scale, if they don't innovate? That, that was more the, the question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Luis. You. Thank you.